Hi, I'm Mike Marin, and in this video, we're going to discuss implementing a permutation test approach to comparing a numeric variable for two groups using R statistical software. This is an alternate approach to the independent two-sample t-test, or the non-parametric approach of the Mann-Whitney u-test, also known as the Wilcoxon rank sum test. We've also previously looked at implementing a bootstrapping approach on this same dataset. In a separate video, I explain the concept and general approach of a permutation test specifically as it applies to this data and the question examined in this video. You can find the link to that video and other related videos in the video description. You can also find the data and the R script used in this video on our website, and a link is also provided in the video description as well. It's recommended that you watch the video explaining the concept of a permutation test before watching this one. For now, I'll provide a short recap of that. I've already imported the data, so let's take a look at it here. You'll note that we can use the view command to add the data to the viewfinder in R. We can also take a look at a bit about the data here. We can see this data set has two variables, weight as well as feed type. So this data consists of comparing weight gain after six weeks for chicks on two different diets. If we look at the levels of the feed, we can see the diets or feed type are casein or meat meal. If we ask for a table of these, we can also see the data only consists of 23 observations in total, 12 measurements on casein, 11 on meat meal. And we can take a look at a box plot of the weight gain by the two different feed types in order to explore the data a bit. When exploring the concept of a permutation test in the preceding video, we decided to run two different tests simultaneously using two different test statistics. And we're doing this for the sake of demonstration, demonstrating two similar but slightly different approaches. The first test statistic will be the absolute value of the difference in mean weight for each of the two different feed types. You can note that this is the same test statistic that gets used in an independent two-sided two-sample t-test. The second test statistic will be the absolute value of the difference in median weight for each of the two feed types. Now let's get to calculating those two test statistics. We can see here we can use the following command to calculate the mean weight gain for each of the different feed types. Here we can ask for the mean weight for those on casein as well as the mean weight for those on meat meal. And we can calculate the absolute value of the difference in means and store it in an object called test.stat1. Let's do that here. And taking a look at the test statistic, we can see that the absolute difference in means is 46.67 grams. Now we can do the exact same for test statistic two. Here's the median for casein, the median for meat meal, and we can take the absolute difference in medians, store them in test.stat2, and here we see that takes on a value of 79, or the absolute value of the difference in medians is 79 grams. Now at the end of this R script, we've also included some other ways to do these calculations. So you can explore that on your own if you like. At the end, we've also included some R commands for a few of the other more classical hypothesis tests that can be used for this data and this problem. Now let's get started on the permutation test. First thing to note is that we can set a seed. Setting the seed allows you to get the exact same set of random data each time you run the code. This is not necessary to do, but it is handy for reproducibility so that each time I run this code, I'll get the exact same set of permutations or the same permutation data. Now the next few commands after help to make the code a bit more general so that we can easily change the data used, change the context a bit, but not have to change too much of the code that we've written. So here n is the number of observations in the data set, which is going to be 23. P is the number of permutation data sets we'd like to generate. We'll work with 100,000. And the variable is the variable that we'd like to resample from or that we'd like to shuffle or take permutations of. Here we're going to do that with the weight variable. So let's go ahead and submit all of these here. Now the code that follows is going to help us generate p equals 100,000 permutation datasets. The first thing I'm going to do is initialize a matrix called perm samples and we'll use this to store the permutation samples in. This is going to start as a matrix filled with zeros and it's going to have 23 rows and p equals 100,000 columns. So that each column will hold 23 observations 
or a permuted sample of the data. So let's go and initialize that here. Now, we're going to use a loop to generate the 100,000 permutations of the data. First, for i equals 1, we will store in column i equals 1 of perm samples, we'll store a permutation of the variable, and recall that the variable is weight. So here, by sampling without replacement from the variable weight, what we're doing is we're creating a reordering or a permutation of that variable. We'll do this and we'll store it in column i equals 1 of perm samples. We'll then repeat this process p equals 100,000 times, each time creating a new permutation of the data and storing it in a column of perm samples. So let's go ahead and submit that code here. We can take a look at the first five columns of perm samples just to make sure that it's clear exactly what this code is doing for us. So submitting that here, we can see here the perm samples matrix and we're looking at just the first five columns. Now each column of this matrix is a different permutation or a different reordering of the data. You may recall that in the video explaining the concept of the permutation test, we also noted that instead of shuffling up the weight variable, we could instead shuffle up or reorder the labels, that is the feed type. At the end of this R script is some code that works with reshuffling the labels rather than the weight itself. So you can explore that on your own if you'd like. Now, we need to calculate the test statistic, both test stat 1 and test stat 2, for each of the 100,000 permutation samples. Now the code that I'm going to show here could be made a little bit more efficient, but I want it to be very clearly visible of exactly what I'm doing with this code for the sake of teaching and learning. So what I'm going to do here is first I will create two different empty vectors to store the 100,000 permutation test statistics in. One for each of test stat 1 and test stat 2. So I'm doing that here, filling each full of zeros for the moment. Now we'll calculate the test statistics for each of the permutation samples using a loop. It's worth mentioning that this code could be made more efficient by writing a function to do this and then applying that function to the columns of the perm samples matrix. But I'm keeping the code more transparent for the sake of seeing exactly what it's doing here. So what we will do is we will loop through, starting with i equals 1, we will go into the perm samples matrix, column i equals 1. We're going to calculate the mean only for the rows where the feed is equal to casein, or in other words, for the mean of the 12 casein observations. And then we're going to subtract from that the mean of the perm samples column i equals 1 only for the rows where the feed equals meat meal. So here we're calculating the mean for the 11 meat meal observations. We will then take the absolute value of this difference and we'll store it in perm.test.stat1 in position i equals 1. This then loops through for all the columns i equals 1, 2, 3, all the way up to 100,000, doing this for each of the 100,000 different permutation samples. And you can see just below, we do the exact same for test stat 2, although here taking the absolute difference in the medians. So let's submit that code here. Now, depending on the power of your computer, that may take somewhere between 5 to 20 seconds. So first, let's quickly remind ourselves of the observed test statistics. A reminder that the absolute difference in means was 46.67 and the absolute difference in medians was 79. Here we can take a look at the first 15 permutation test statistics for each of test stat 1 and test stat 2. And let's quickly remind ourselves of the definition as well as calculation of the p-value for the permutation test. Here the p-value is trying to estimate what is the probability of getting our observed test statistic, right, the 46.67 or the 79, those values or more extreme or larger if the null hypothesis is true and we'd expect those test statistics to be roughly zero. Focusing on test statistic one, we're asking the question, what's the probability of observing a test statistic of 46.67 grams or more if the null hypothesis really is true and we would expect that test statistic to come out to be zero. Now looking at the first 15 permutation test statistics, 
which were generated under the assumption that the null hypothesis is true, we can see that only 1 in 15 times, that test statistic of 72.9, so only 1 in 15 times did we get a permutation test statistic greater than the observed one of 46.67. So based on just these 15 permutation test statistics, the probability of getting a permutation test stat of 46.67 or more happened 1 in 15 times, or about 6.66%. Now, you'll recall that the p-value is calculated as the number of permutation test statistics that are greater than the observed test statistic divided by p, the number of permutation test statistics we've calculated in total. So we can get r to do this. First, we'll note that we can ask r a true or false question. Here we'd like to ask, is the permutation test statistic greater than the observed test statistic of 46.67? So let's ask that question for only the first 15 permutation test statistics. We can see here for the first, we're asking, is that 44.2 greater than the observed test stat of 46.67? And the answer is false. Is that second one of 39.8 greater than the observed one of 46.67? Again, the answer is false. We can see only one time we returned a value of true, and that's for the 72.9. Now, we can ask R for the mean of these true or falses. And here, it will treat a false as a zero and a true as a one. So doing that here, we can see it will return the p-value of 0 0.0666. Okay, again, for those only the 15 um, permutation test statistics, 6.67% of them were greater than the observed test stat. Now, let's go ahead and calculate the p-value for permutation test statistic 1 for all 100,000 permutation test statistics. Here we can see the p-value comes out to be 0.09747, or roughly 9.7%. So interpreting that p-value, if in reality the null hypothesis is true, and there is no difference in the means, we see an absolute sample difference of 46.67, the one we observed, about 9.7% of the time. Now, we can also go through and ask the R statistical software to calculate the p-value for test statistic two. Doing so here in a similar fashion, we get a p-value of 5.42%. Now, in a textbook world, with either of these, if you used an alpha or a significance level of 5%, you'd fail to reject the null hypothesis. Although, I'd like you to recall the difference between statistical significance versus scientific or clinical significance. We've talked about this a lot over all of our videos. We don't want to get ourselves stuck on this magical cutoff of alpha of 5% and make statements like reject the null when p-value is 4%, fail to reject when the p-value is 6%. Those two p-values are roughly the same to me. So while these are not statistically significant, we do have some evidence that these feed types may differ and probably worth exploring more. It's worth recalling that this test was based on 23 total observations, 12 in one feed type, 11 in the other. So we have a pretty small sample size and pretty low power to detect a difference if one exists. You'll also recall that we've talked a lot about how confidence intervals and not hypothesis tests can be a bit more useful at times. So it's worth noting here that a permutation approach does not actually allow for the construction of a confidence interval, although bootstrapping a very closely related concept to permutation testing does. In a separate video, we show both the concept as well as the implementation using R of a bootstrap confidence interval for this exact same data set. Now in the R script below, we also included some code to make a plot of the sampling distribution for the permutation test statistics, as well as some code to reshuffle the labels or the feed type rather than reshuffling the weight gain variable. So you can check that out if you like. Um, subscribe to our channel. Buck, buck. <laughs> like our videos. If you like them, share them with your friends.